Good morning. Welcome to this morning's SciFell discussion on the ride. So focusing on our episode for this morning, the ride, um, where would our students like to start? Uh, any character scene that you'd like to discuss first? Maybe Elaine. Elaine, so um, what did you say? She was like not satisfied with the, like certain aspects of the her her romantic relationship, and she so she was like, um, in the beginning of the episode, like telling Jerry about that. And you know the, the background, which is interesting, is that um, Elaine and Jerry um, uh, had previous had a previous intimate relationship. Um, so I mean, and this could evolve into a true friendship. There's no doubt about it. And it could be well within normal behavior. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I think Larry David keeps uh, some sexual tension to make sure that there's enough conflict between these two friends um, for comedic value, but for us, uh, perhaps some clinical value. Uh, so there might be something up with her confiding in Jerry the way she does about intimate things, um, such as her new relationship. Um, I love the fact that her new boyfriend composes something called Hot and Heavy, and there's problems with his performance, uh, which the connotation, of course, is a sexual dysfunction. So uh, I'm not going to really get into a lot of that right now this morning. Matter of fact, we really don't cover it on the consult service per se, but the sexual dysfunctions can and will be covered on standardized exams and perhaps the shelf exam. So um, this is what I would strongly recommend. Uh, we're talking now about the chapter of the DSM called the sexual disorders. I think students have to feel comfortable with there being three separate chapters that previously were known as the sexual disorders. One happens to be sexual dysfunctions. These are dysfunctions. Uh, these are problems that could take place at any phase of the sexual response cycle. So I think in prepping for your shelf exam, uh, I would get your favorite board review text. Um, I would jump on um, your PC, um, your iPad. I would search sexual response cycle images and have that image come up and pair that visual with the review, the outline uh, in your favorite board review text. I think it's an easy way and I think a very straightforward way to identify that there are about one, perhaps two different disorders linked to each of those phases. And I think that's the best way to review. And I think that's the best way to study for yourself. Number two, there is a condition called gender dysphoria. Uh, that's in a chapter of itself. Gender dysphoria is just that. It's dysphoria, it's depression, due to the incongruence between uh, one's uh, sexual assignment at birth and their identified gender. So that's gender dysphoria. Um, and then there's a third and final chapter, which are the sexual deviancies. Now, gender dysphoria, sexual deviancies, uh, not part of this particular episode, not part of the rye, uh, but um, the sexual deviancies, again, can appear on your shelf exam. Um, I would, uh, number one, appreciate that these deviancies, 2013, terminology changed to disorders always have to result in clinically significant distress or impairment in self or others. Uh, otherwise, it is just a deviancy and not a dis disorder. Uh, number two, these conditions, whether we're going to call it a deviancy or whether they truly rise to the level or threshold of a disorder, um, always have to, that is the behavior always has to result in sexual gratification. If, and I think uh, cross-dressing is a great example. If an individual uh, dresses in the clothes of the opposite sex, but it's not for sexual gratification, it is not a mental disorder. It's not the mental disorder that is published in the DSM called you know, transvestic fetish. Uh, 
So be careful. It's not the behavior in and of itself. It's the behavior um, that's defined by the outcome of sexual gratification. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. Um, and then I think finally, the last thing to do, the third thing to do in studying these sexual deviancies, otherwise known as the paraphilias, is then to identify what the actual behavior is, or at least review so that you feel comfortable identifying it on the shelf exam, right? So um, you know, watching others undress, disrobe, or have sex versus exposing one's genitals. I mean, what's the core feature that allows you to differentiate um, um, exhibitionism from frauderism from uh, et cetera. So um, that's the third and final thing. I think, uh, and again, this is an ultra brief two plus minute primer, uh, but uh, I think if you follow those steps, you'll be well prepared to really uh, address and tackle any uh, sexual disorder question on your shelf exam. So hot and heavy, Elaine's boyfriend, poor performance, sexual dysfunction, one of three chapters, the other two being gender dysphoria and the paraphilias, otherwise known as the sexual deviancies. Anything else with Elaine? Any other characters? Uh, caught your eye uh, in watching the ride. I think George. Um, I don't know if there's like a defense mechanism term for like what he did. Like he, he was trying to like write the wrong of like what happened with the rye. And I feel like there might be like a defense mechanism term for that. Um, and I thought that was, that was really interesting. Yeah, I think on the surface, I would say perhaps undoing. Um, and, you know, undoing has a definition that is very consistent with what you just, uh, just described. Uh, it's a mental process or behavior uh, that um, reverses uh, a conflict and therefore alleviates anxiety. All, I mean, all, all conflicts, friction, anxiety, those terms are, are synonymous in terms of the topography of the subconscious, as per Sigmund Freud. Um, and the ego defense mechanisms have that major role in alleviating anxiety, alleviating the friction caused by that conflict. So maybe undoing. Which, which is interesting, and you know, and uh, what you know, I keep on saying this, and I know it's the first time I'm saying this to your class, your rotation, perhaps to see this uh, this uh, internship. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, I, I always find I'm going to so just digress and maybe go off on a bit of a tangent here. Um, Jerry Seinfeld sits at one end of a pole where he is a wonderful character to review aspects of obsessive compulsive personality. Um, he's perfectionistic. He needs order, he needs control, and he definitely shows signs of clinically significant distress and or impairment when he is not in control or when things are not perfect or not perfectly clean, okay? Uh, very straightforward definition, and I think a very straightforward depiction. Uh, and that's wonderful because if you ever kind of get confused, especially perhaps in trying to figure out what OCPD is compared to obsessive compulsive disorder, think of Jerry Seinfeld. So that's good news. On the other hand, that opposite pole in my mind is George Costanza. Uh, we could create an entire curriculum by examining the behaviors of George Costanza over the nine seasons of Seinfeld because it seems with every episode, he's demonstrating behaviors that might be indicative of a different mental disorder each week. Um, and now, I think on the service, most people would think, well, that's not good because that could be confusing. From a teaching perspective, it's wonderful because George is real. Uh, George behaves and his behaviors are quite often maladaptive and often result in clinically significant distress. However, he defies the textbook terminology. He, and, and as human behavior exists, most of the time, it does not fit into these perfect artificial categories created by the APA. That's George Costanza. So there's a big time silver lining in George as well. So, and you've got these best friends that really represent and can teach psychiatry through very different styles. What's interesting is that George, because he is all over the place, 
very frequently does demonstrate aspects of obsessive compulsive personality. And I bring this up because one example is one that is uncovered in the ROM. Undoing is actually thought to be part of the OCPD slash OCD spectrum. It's a defense mechanism uh, that underlies these mental conditions. But on the surface, nobody would ever think George has obsessive compulsive personality. It's Jerry, that's the opposite, Paul. And this is but one example of that. There are probably a dozen where we have a discussion about George Costanza and the personality disorder of obsessive compulsive personality is part of that discussion. And I, I'll always mention, but he is not OCPD. Again, that's his best friend, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. So one day I'm gonna be taking notes of this and one day we'll publish a paper on it. But uh, until then, uh, I'll have to keep on referring back to it. So uh, I would guess that's my long-winded review of undoing and perhaps how it relates to what we observe in George Costanza's behavior, not Jerry Seinfeld's, but George's behavior in the ride. What do you think about George and his relationship with Dina? More specifically, Dina's father? Nothing there? All right, uh, different character? Um, I, sorry, <laughs> sorry, we're on the same room, so that was actually a bit. Um, so I was, I thought it was interesting that Frank, um, George's dad, when they were in the car on the way home and he was talking about uh, the interaction with the family, how he was thinking that it was purposeful that they didn't put out the bread and he was like very, very adamant about it. Um, and then it kind of flashes to the other family and they're like, oh, we just forgot. Um, but he's kind of paranoid that, you know, they're judging him and his family and that it was all purposeful behavior. Yep. And let's say that this leads to something that's clinically significant. And let's say that because of that, either he self-reports or perhaps maybe is accompanied by George to an appointment to see you. Okay, um, you, you got to help me. Um, what are some questions uh, that are on your mind that you would like to ask Mr. Costanza? Or we can take it from a different perspective. What's the first thing that comes to mind in terms of a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis? Anyone? Well, one thing that I would definitely ask about is um, like, does he ever feel this way with other people? Um, what else have you felt? Um, I wouldn't use the word persecuted, but I would ask questions about those feelings and in what other settings he was having those responses to other people or events. Now, I, I, I've watched all nine seasons, and even if Mr. Costanza can't or won't answer that question, a collateral, myself, will provide the information that absolutely it is true that he does think this way and feel this way towards other people as well. So now what are we thinking? I mean, I guess it depends if he has... Um other symptoms, but if it's like just one specific feeling of being persecuted by other people around him and that leads him to change his behavior and interactions with others, I guess you could consider um, maybe like a delusional disorder um, if it's just that one symptom where he has like delusional persecution. And let's confirm that by saying that I really don't recall Mr. Costanza demonstrating any perceptual disturbances. Um, you know, he, he's funny, but I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that I've ever seen or observed a disorganized or catatonic behavior. Um, and I'm not sure I've ever seen really clinically significant negative symptoms, right? The pathological absence of something that at baseline should be there. So, uh, and I'm, I'm quite confident in that reporting. So we're going along the lines of perhaps delusional disorder. Uh, let's say upon further examination, um, and this, this might require a good 90 minute psychiatric evaluation, uh, we determine that there really aren't fixed beliefs per se. Uh, 
what now might, might be included in differential. So I'm not going to dismiss delusional disorder, uh, but I just think if we're hearing that it doesn't sound like there are fixed beliefs, aka delusions, we may have to broaden our differential here. What might be included in our differential diagnosis at this time? Anyone? Like a paranoid personality disorder? Yeah, because what I'm hearing then is that it feels like there's a pervasive suspiciousness and distrust of others. And boy, I mean, is that defining of this character? Uh, maybe a paranoid personality disorder. Uh, so I, I would include that in differential diagnosis. Uh, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about personality disorders because we're going to jump into this discussion as soon as noonish today um, with um, our film discussion, including seven. So um, and we're going to follow that up with the fatal attraction and perhaps even Gone Girl. So we're going to have, you know, a, a grouping of fictional cases of personality disorder. So let's allow Seifeld to introduce this. Whether it's in clinical practice or whether it's on a shelf exam, there are certain rules to this that all clinicians really have to appreciate. Okay, number one, uh, a personality disorder absolutely must be clinically significant. Uh, there's this school of thought that since these were previously coded on axis two and not axis one, that therefore they were always milder than the axis one psychopathologies, that is not the case. I'm not really sure why they were coded on axis two. I'm sure there's historical value there, but the bottom line here is that in the previous classification system, the fact that these were second tier axis two diagnoses has nothing to do with clinical significance. These conditions are clinically significant and as clinically significant, if not more sometimes, than those conditions that were coded on axis one on that top tier, like major depressive disorder, like schizophrenia. So that's first and foremost. So don't fall into that trap. Uh, number two, these conditions are pervasive. So at any one point in time, they cross multiple social situations. If an individual appears to have a personality disorder at work, but at home is a different person, it is unlikely their signs and symptoms can be attributed or should be attributed to a personality disorder. These conditions by definition are pervasive. Also, they're stable. So um, very frequently individuals over time will demonstrate the same personality traits. So not only do they cross social situations and settings at any one point in time, but they're also stable over time. And that's very, very important to recognize. Next, these conditions, these behaviors cannot be the direct physiologic effect of a substance or a medical condition. And hopefully everybody knew that because that principle is applied to every mental disorder, even those that were previously coded in Axis One. So the same rule holds true for the personality disorders. And finally, they, that is the behaviors, the traits, can not be attributed to a primary mental disorder. You have to be very careful to assess and to diagnose a personality disorder in the setting of active mania in or during an exacerbation of schizophrenia or an episode of depression. So be very careful because what you're seeing as signs and symptoms suggestive of a personality disorder cannot be attributable to a mental disorder, just like it cannot be attributed to the direct and physiologic effects of a substance or medical condition. So those are the general rules that apply to every single personality disorder. Once you understand that in clinical practice, and once those five or six rules are obeyed, only then can you begin to investigate for a personality disorder, and that holds true on a shelf exam as well. All right, so that's the, again, brief introduction, in, introduction to what we'll now get into a fair degree of detail about uh, at our noon discussion, um, which will start with uh, David Fincher's seven. About five minutes ago in our discussion of Seinfeld's The Rye, um, anything else you'd like to discuss here about any other characters? <laughs> 
Let's talk about the Rosses a little bit. We'll kind of end our discussion this morning on the Rosses. A uh, couple of things that kind of jump out at you here. Um, any thoughts? So I think number one, um, Mrs. Ross does appear to demonstrate signs and symptoms that are suggestive of alcohol use disorder. Uh, she's certainly a heavy drinker. Uh, so there, there's a possible investigation there. And there's a couple of teaching points as well as clinical pearls to be made here. Uh, number one, we really have to focus on whether the behavior is clinically significant and it may or may not be, and that may or may not be demonstrated in this episode of the ride. So um, as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, uh, that is always the line to cross. And then I think the other teaching point here is related to that. And that is, if you look through the DSM criteria of what defines alcohol use disorder, and you can use this for any substance uh, um, induced disorder. Uh, this, could, this applies to stimulants, opioids, any substance. Uh, the frequency with which the substance is used and the amount it's used have nothing to do with the definition of a mental illness, right? So uh, she does drink heavily. So this might prompt uh, screening for a substance use disorder, specifically alcohol use disorder, but that's as far as it goes. Now, wh where that screening tool goes, where that screen goes, positive screen versus not, and then the structured clinical interview in ruling in versus not, uh, of course, is in our future. But the frequency with which she drinks and how much she drinks per episode, aka a heavy drinker, those two variables have nothing to do with the definition of alcohol use disorder, just like they have nothing to do with the definition of any substance use disorder. So um, again, as clinicians, please keep that in the back of your head. What do you think about their behavior now as a couple uh, on that um, the cab ride? Or should I say change in behavior? Any observation there? Anybody appreciate their change in affect? And their affect completely changes. I mean, they're kind to each other, they cuddle, they seem happy. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen that, and I'd have to go back, I'd have to be honest, um, but I'm not so sure I actually see that in any other episode that the Ross is appearing. It's that, that's that single scene in the ride where they actually look happy. Um, not that we would have to case formulate that, but if we were to, any ideas of how, and I don't know how many episodes they're in, uh, but if they're in X number of episodes, that in this single episode for that single scene, why are they happy? What might be, and if, and if they're coming to you because they are unhappy, uh, this might be part of the conversation. Because if the therapist asked the question, can you relate to me a time when you were happy? Maybe they say, oh yeah, that handsome cab ride. Uh, that our uh, future son-in-law set up for us. That was nice. Uh, it might be worthwhile to kind of investigate why, because if we could figure out why, we might be able to, uh, to learn from that and apply some of those things discovered to other aspects of their life. Any guesses as to why? Um, um, one thing that they did mention before they got in the cab ride was that it was the first time that they had done something romantic, just the two of them in a very long time. Um, so I guess I don't necessarily think it's anything like pathologic, but just encouraging them to continue to like make that time for themselves and each other in their relationship. Yeah, and I would hope a similar comment might actually be uh, verbalized in the therapist's office because what we heard, I think, is very telling. Uh, and if the, if the therapist heard that, uh, there's where you explore. And, and I, I'm wondering if their smile as they're, they're, they're riding through town has something to do with classical conditioning. 
right? Uh, the experience related to a previous experience, and that is learning by association, uh, classical conditioning. So uh, that might be an area to explore if if we were to, if we were to, if if they were to um, present to clinical attention. That said, um, a couple of other thoughts uh, as we sign off. Classical conditioning as well as operative conditioning are fair game okay, on shelf exams. So please review the basic principles of classical conditioning. That's Pavlovian conditioning. That's learning by association, similar to the Rosses, versus operant conditioning, um, consequential learning, like Skinnerian learning. Right? So uh, we could talk about this more in more detail and other aspects of uh, patient care on the CL service, but uh, a brief review of classical and operant conditioning uh, for this uh, for the shelf exam. Any final thoughts? All right, we'll leave it here. Uh, we will be back um, at 12 o'clock with our film discussion. Uh, and then for those following at home over Zoom, we will be logging on at uh, momentarily at or around 8.30 for our table rounds. See everybody back then.